Hello and welcome back to Real Analysis. And as always, first I want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. Now, in today's part 59, we will talk about the integration by partial fraction decomposition. This is helpful when you want to integrate rational functions. For example, we could have the function 1 divided by x times x plus 1. And maybe now we want to integrate this from 3 to 5. And now, of course, it would be nice if we had an antiderivative for this function. Indeed, exactly there, the partial fraction decomposition can help. So let's immediately explain this for this example here. The problem for us is that the denominator looks too complicated to immediately see the antiderivative. However, what we immediately see is that we can rewrite this with two fractions. So we have 1 divided by x minus 1 divided by x plus 1. In fact, you can check that this is the same by just expanding the fractions here. So you see, the first part we just multiply with x plus 1. And the second fraction we multiply with x. And then what you should see is that we can write this with one denominator and then we would subtract x in the numerator. Hence what remains is exactly the original rational function here. Or in summary, we can decompose this fraction into two partial fractions. Therefore, this rewriting here is called the partial fraction decomposition. And in fact, this helps a lot for finding the antiderivative. Okay, at this point I can tell you that often the antiderivative is denoted with the integral sign as well. So more precisely, by not writing any limits on the integral sign here, this symbol usually represents the collection of all antiderivatives of this function. Indeed, this is helpful when you just want to use the calculation rules of the integral. For example, here we obviously want to use the linearity of the integral. Exactly this is the reason why the partial fraction decomposition is so helpful. Hence you can see, now we have to find the antiderivative of this function and the antiderivative of that function. And in fact, this is not hard at all. For example, we already know the derivative of the logarithm is 1 over x. In fact, this also works for negative x if we include the absolute value here. And in the same way, the antiderivative of the second function is the logarithm of x plus 1. And also here, when we include the absolute value, we also have covered the case that the input x plus 1 is negative. So I think this is what you can easily check by just forming the derivative of these two functions. Okay, now in summary, this here is one antiderivative of this function. Of course, you already know you get another antiderivative when you add a constant. And sometimes, as a reminder, this constant is written at the end of such an equation. However, please be careful, if you want to be precise, you have to write down the domain of the original function and the antiderivative. And if this domain is not an interval, you could choose different constants on different parts of the domain. But if you calculate a normal integral with limits, there shouldn't be any problems then. For example here, now we could just put 5 and 3 into our antiderivative. Okay, now I think you are interested how we can do the partial fraction decomposition in general. Indeed, there is a recipe so you don't have to guess it like we did it before. However, the general formulation is not so tidy, so we definitely should do an example afterwards. So let's fix a rational function f, which can be written with two polynomials. This means f of x is given by p of x divided by q of x. And now important for us is that the degree of q is strictly greater than the degree of p. So the highest power n we have in the denominator is greater than the highest power we have in the numerator. If this is not the case, you can always do a polynomial long division to get this part out. Hence, this is indeed the interesting case for our integration. 
And now in order to do the partial fraction decomposition as before, we need the zeros of q. In other words, it's good to have such linear factors in the denominator. Therefore, it's possible to distinguish three cases. The first case is the best case where we find exactly n different real zeros. So maybe let's call them x1, x2 and so on until we reach xn. Now, please note, this means that we can rewrite q with linear factors. And therefore, the partial fraction decomposition looks like before. Therefore, it should be possible to split up the rational function into n simple fractions. However, in general, it would not be possible to get ones here. So any coefficients a1, a2 and so on could be possible. Hence, what one has to do in the partial fraction decomposition is to find these coefficients. In fact, we can show that we get a system of linear equations that has exactly one solution. And how to solve it, I show you in the example soon. However, before we do that, let's talk about the second, more complicated case. There, we only have k different real zeros, so we have higher multiplicities. So let's call these multiplicities alpha1, alpha2 and so on. So for example, the zero x1 has the multiplicity alpha1. And of course, the multiplicities should be natural numbers between 1 and n. Moreover, you also know the sum of the multiplicities can't be greater than n. Indeed, in this case we want that the sum is exactly n. In other words, this means in this case the polynomial q does not have any strict complex zeros. Hence, as in the first case, we only have real zeros. Moreover, you should see the second case is more general than the first case. And for this reason, the formula we get is not so compact anymore. Indeed, now this linear factor here occurs exactly as often as the multiplicity tells you. So for the first one, we have exactly alpha 1 terms. And of course, there should not be quite the same. In fact, we have powers involved. So we start with the power 1, then comes power 2 and so on until we reach the power alpha 1. And now you might already guess, as before, we don't have 1s here, but coefficients. Now, these coefficients correspond to the first zero, so we have the index 1, but we need a second index for the power. And there you might already see, this is not the most beautiful formula. And of course it gets even bigger because we have to do this for every zero. Okay, therefore the next one would be x2 with exactly alpha 2 terms. So here I think you now know how the general formula should look like. In addition, the example we will do will explain the formula even better. However, before we do this, let me shortly explain the third case here. We can summarize it by saying that the denominator q has complex zeros. Now, I don't want to go into the details because when you work with complex numbers, you can do all the calculations as with the real numbers. In other words, you can do exactly the same as before, but now the zeros are complex numbers and the coefficients as well. In fact, from the calculation side, this does not change anything at all. However, the interpretation is different because for a moment we leave the real realm here. In other words, in the end we have to summarize everything to get a real function back. However, I think this will be a topic for another video. In this video now, I want to concentrate on a real example. More precisely, we will tackle the second case. Here our rational function f is given by p is equal to 1 and q is equal to x squared times x minus 1. Hence we can immediately read the two zeros the denominator has. It's 0 and plus 1. And moreover the multiplicities are given by 2 and 1. So by using our formula from above we see we get exactly three terms. The denominator of the first one will be simply x minus x1, which means we can just write x. 
In the same way, the second one will be x squared. And for the last one, we have the 0, 1, so x minus 1. Okay, now we need the coefficients, so we look back at our formula and see a 1, 1, a 1, 2, and a 2, 1. Of course, in our example, these are not the best names, therefore let's choose a, b, and c. Indeed, you always should do this in explicit calculations. Okay, and now we reach the point that I can explain how we can calculate the coefficients a, b, and c. The first step is that we multiply on both sides with the denominator q. When we do this, naturally, all the fractions will vanish. Hence, everything will look much nicer. For example, here in the first part, 1x will cancel. Then, in the second part, x squared will cancel. And finally, in the last part, only x squared remains. Okay, now you should see, we have a polynomial on the right hand side, as well as on the left hand side. Indeed, this one is the original polynomial, the numerator p, and this one is a new one. However, the equation tells us both are the same. Therefore, the idea is to bring the right hand side into a standard form for a polynomial. More precisely, this means we have x squared times the coefficient plus x times the coefficient plus 1 times the coefficient. Hence, we expand here and then we factor out again. And here we get a plus c for x squared and minus a plus b for x and finally just minus b for the factor 1. And now we can just compare the coefficients on the left hand side to the coefficients on the right hand side. In other words, this one should be 0, this one should be 0, and this one should be plus 1. And indeed, the best thing you can do is to write this immediately as a system of linear equations. Or to put it in other words, as a matrix vector multiplication. There, the first equation reads a plus c is equal to 0 which means we have 1, 0, 1, and a 0 here. Then the second equation minus a plus b is equal to 0 reads as minus 1 plus 1, 0, 0. And finally the last equation is minus b is equal to 1, so 0 minus 1, 0 is equal to 1. Now if you know linear algebra, you know we can write this in a short form. We only use the matrix and the right hand side comes in as well. Okay, now solving such a system of linear equations just means bringing this matrix to a row echelon form. More precisely, this means we want to generate zeros here. Therefore, the first step is take the second row and add the first row. Please note, this means we only change the second row. And the result here is 0, 1, 1, 0. So, and then in the next step, we want to generate a 0 here. Therefore, we take the third row and add the new second row. Hence, what we get is 0, 0, 1, 1. Okay, and then we are finished, we can read the solution here. Namely, first we have c is equal to 1. So this is simply this last equation here. And by using this, the second equation tells us that b is minus 1. And finally, the first equation gives us the same for a. So in summary, our partial fraction decomposition is finished. Hence indeed, our rational function here can be written in this form. And of course, as we did at the beginning of the video, you can check that this really works out. Just put the fractions back together and look if this comes out. However, please don't forget that we want to integrate this function. In other words, now we have to solve three integrals here. And as before, two of them are the logarithm. So the first one is minus the logarithm of the absolute value of x. And indeed, also the third one is the logarithm, but now with x minus 1 in the absolute value inside. Therefore, the last equation we have to answer is what is the antiderivative of minus 1 over x squared? 
However, there we know the formula, this is simply 1 over x. So you see, this is simply applying the power rule when you form derivatives. Of course, for integrals, you have to do it backwards. Therefore, you should see, whenever we have this partial fraction decomposition, we can form the antiderivative. Simply because we already have all the ingredients to do it. Okay, so in summary, now you know how you can integrate rational functions. And with this, I think it's good enough for today. And I hope that I see you in part 60. Have a nice day and bye. Thank you.